Well, good morning. If you have your Bibles with you this morning, I want to encourage you to open them with me to Joshua chapter 1. Uh, we'll be getting here in verse 10. And, and as you, you're opening your Bibles or, or turning on your screens, whichever it happens to be, um, I want to share a little bit about the song that Enrico had, and the team had just uh, sung. Uh, it's a song is composed by a gentleman named Matt Pappas, and uh, I can forget the second gentleman's name. Contribute. Boswell, thank you, thank you. I don't know what I do without people to remind me of what I don't know. Um, so, but it, this particular song was written, uh, inspired from a letter composed by John Newton in 1767. Uh, now, John Newton may be a name that you remember, may sound familiar. <coughs> Excuse me. In any case, it's, it's not as a way of a reminder. John Newton was a, a slave trader who came to know the Lord uh, through grace and through tremendous mercy, became an abolitionist, a leader in the ending of the slave trade in England and through, in London and his positions in London. He also later, by God's grace and calling, became an Anglican minister. Uh, he was mo probably perhaps, perhaps most famous for being known as the writer of the song Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound, that saved a wretch like you and me. Um, but this, he was also a prolific letter writer to the members of his congregation. And so this particular letter, which inspired the song that was written here, and is, was written to a gentleman who wrote to his pastor and said, I keep struggling with sin. I keep struggling with temptation. Uh, I echo the words of Paul. I keep doing what I don't want to do, and I don't do what I want to do. And so Newton writes back to him in, in 1767, on March 18, 1767, and just a section of this letter says this. He says, you have one hard lesson to learn. That is the evil of your own heart. You know something of it, but it is needful that you should know more. For the more we know ourselves, the more we shall prize and love Jesus and his salvation. He goes on, our sins are many but his mercies are more. Our sins are great, but his righteousness is greater. We are weak, but he is power. Most of our complaints are owing to unbelief and the remainder of a legal spirit. And these evils are not removed in a day. Wait on the Lord, and he will enable you to see more and more of the power and the grace of our high priest. The more you know him, the better you will trust him. The more you trust him, the better you will love him. The more you love him, the better you will serve him. Be humble, watchful, and diligent in the means and endeavor to look through all and fix your eyes upon Jesus and all shall be well. Powerful words from a pastor's heart to a man in his church is just absolutely struggling with sin. And that phrase of his, our sins are many, but his mercies are more, and the heart will not be changed within a day, is an excellent reminder of where we come into in these particular verses in, John, in Joshua chapter 1. We're looking here at God's people as they are encamped on the eastern side of the Jordan River, being prepared to move from one place to the next. And there are people in this group who are making commitments, being called to commitments, and declaring what they will do. But what they perhaps don't remember, what we already know, is that we don't do everything that we say we're going to do. And his grace, is, his grace is many, and his mercy is more, because our sins are many. Look here, you will, and we'll read these verses together and then break them down uh, together. Joshua chapter 1, verse 10, it says, And Joshua commanded the officers of the people, pass through the midst of the camp, and command the people, prepare your provisions, for within three days you are, going to pa you are to pass over this Jordan and to go in to take possession of the land that the Lord your God is giving you to possess. And to the Reubenites and the Gadites and the half-tribe of Manasseh, Joshua said, Remember the word that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you. The Lord your God is providing you a place of rest and will give you this land. 
Your wives, your little ones, and your livestock shall remain in the land that Moses gave you beyond the Jordan, but where they are now, in other words. But all the men of valor among you shall pass over armed before your brothers and shall help them. And so the Lord gives rest to your brothers as he has given to you. And they shall take possession of the land that the Lord your God is giving them. Then you shall return to the land of your possession and shall possess it, the land that Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you beyond the Jordan toward the sunrise. And they answered Joshua, all that you've commanded us, we will do. And wherever you send us, we will go. Just as we obeyed Moses in all things, so we will obey you. Only may the Lord your God be with you, as he was with Moses. Whoever rebels against your commandment and disobeys your words, whatever you command him, shall be put to death. Only be strong and courageous. Let's pray together here before we go any further. Father God, we do come to you and thank you for your, your tremendous mercy, your amazing grace. And Lord, I, I pray that as we open up your word here today, that you would just speak to us, uh, that we would leave here changed because you've done something here. You would open our ears to, to receive the words. You would open our hearts to receive your voice. You would open our eyes to see you. That we'd be changed because of your grace and your mercy. I ask that you'd use me in these few moments to lift up Jesus so we'll see him and nothing else. And I ask this in his name. Amen. This, this is kind of an odd little story. So it's, it's very, very basic. And you see the natural divisions as you're reading through the chapters. There's, there's three divisions as you read through the verses. You know, Joshua speaks to his commanders. And then these two and a half tribes respond back to Joshua. Or he actually speaks to them. And then all of the people together, including these, these two separate tribes, tell Joshua, hey, we're going to do everything you told us to do. It, it seems like a pretty, pretty simple, straightforward, almost a, a transition from one place to another. But there are some things here, there's about four things in these particular verses that, that I want us to see together about what it means to walk with the Lord. As Joshua points us to be living the Christian life and living a life that honors Christ, what does it mean to walk with him? And there's four things that I want you to, to notice here in these particular verses. The, the first thing I want you to notice as we kind of give some headings here to verses 10 and 11 is that it's time to move. It's time to go forward. Joshua says, now is the time. In three days, we're crossing over the Jordan River. Get your, he tells his commanders, go out between the camp. I want you to find everybody. Tell them it's time to go. Get your provisions ready. Provisions here are everything they need to cross the river. To Once they cross the river, to go to war. Get everything you need. It's time. The time has come to move. Now, there's a couple of things here that we need to know looking in on this, so far removed from this real time and real place and real people. And one of them is this. The river at this particular time is at flood stage. Well, we know that from chapter 3. And so as these people are, are camped where they are on the eastern side of the river, they're looking at where they need to be going, and they're seeing cr to cross over. It's just not a, a little trickle. It, this is a river at absolute flood stage. Now, I want you to know this because we, we need to know our Bibles. We need to know what the Lord has to say. And this is important because there are times when you look at the Jordan River that it's just a, an absolute trickle. There are times it's dried up as it runs down uh, north and south from the Dead Sea to the Sea of Galilee, or excuse me, Sea of Galilee to the Dead Sea. Um, and so there are times where it's just easy to cross. This is not one of those times. There's great challenge in front of them. Not only the, the, the combat they're going to enter into as they take possession of the land the Lord has already promised them, but just getting from point A to point B is going to come with some challenge. And Joshua tells them, it's time to cross, it's time to go. Now, if, if you're reading ahead, you may notice, or as you read ahead, which I would encourage you to do so, you come into the next chapter, and we'll get to, hope, Lord willing, next time, the, the two men go into the city of Jericho to spy out the city, and they flee, and they hide for three days in the wilderness. You also, as you read ahead in the chapter 3, you see that it's taken them three days to go from where they are to get ready to cross the Jordan River, three additional days. 
And so as we're reading through these chapters together, it may come across to you or you may have a dialogue with someone and say, hey, in chapter one, he says, we're crossing in three days, but they don't cross till six or seven days later. What's wrong here? This doesn't make sense. Now, I want to point that out for a couple of reasons. One, we need to know our Bibles. We need to know what it says. We need to know what it means. But also, I want you to notice here, I think there's a principle for us. Our time is not God's time. Our timing is not God's timing. Now, Joshua could have been instructing the people. He could have been absolutely ambitious and saying, hey, in three days, we're crossing over. He could have not realized that hey, I'm sending out these spies at the same day. I'm telling these commanders to go out and prepare the people. I didn't know they're going to be stuck for three days. There could be all kinds of factors happening as to why it's taking them from this moment to at least six or seven days later to absolutely cross. But there's a principle here as we know the Lord that our time is not his time. God is not bound by our schedules. That is painful, a painful lesson to receive because I want God to do his miracles and perform his promises on my schedule. God, I've got a thing at 10 and a thing at 11, so if you could perform that miracle at 9.30, we'd be really good. God is always bound to his promises, but he is never tied to your schedule. Proverbs 16.9 reminds us here that the heart of a man plans his ways, but the Lord establishes his steps. The Lord is always orchestrating his will, but not necessarily on our timeline. And the picture here that the Lord is doing is that he's, he's always bound to his promises, but he's never bound to, to our schedules. And we need to know that as we're going to follow him. If you are going to follow hard after the Lord Jesus Christ and want to see God at work in your life, a life of faith means that God will work out his will and his time and his way. And it may not be mine. There's a reminder here in these verses. Colossians 1 reminds us here as we think about living out his purposes. Colossians 1 reminds us that, that what was accomplished in Jesus Christ is that he delivered us from the domain of darkness into the kingdom of his beloved son in his time. God is always at work in his own time. Joshua comes up to the people and says, it's time to move in God's time. But then notice also this conversation that he has beginning in verse 12. He approaches these two tribes who have agreed uh, to stay on the eastern side of the Jordan. Now, for the promise, the land that God has given them to possess is on the western side. So they have to go from where they are to where it is God wants them to be in order to be the people that God wants them to be. But here's this group of people who have been given permission, given authorization to remain where they are with some conditions. If you notice the conditions, Joshua comes to him and says that as the Lord has spoken through Moses, so this is not me to you, this is not Moses to you, but this is the Lord holding you to this commitment that if you are to remain here, this place, then all your mighty men of valor, all of your warriors have to cross over and fight with the rest of us. And so the Lord gives them rest and peace and then they can return. There's a, there's a couple of things here that really jump out and I want to draw you to you. And one major principle here that from these verses, it, it seems if you're reading along and think that, that why in the world would um, they say that we need to stay here with our children, our wives and our livestock, are they all equal? Well, no, the answer isn't that they're all equal. The answer is that these are the things that are most important to them. These are the things that matter to them. They're their children and their wives and their livelihood. We're leaving these guys here and we're sending our warriors to cross over with you and then they will return one day. But I want you to know what they're doing. They're, we're going to build cities for them. We're going to build, we're going to build pens for them. We, we come back, as, they, the, as Joshua says from verse 13, remember the word that goes back to two locations in the Old Testament. One of them is Numbers 32 and the other is Deuteronomy 3. And in Numbers 32, these, these leaders from these tribes come to Moses and say, hey, this land is awesome. Everywhere we look, it's fantastic. Our cattle, our sheep, all the livestock we have, they're going to thrive over here. We want to stay here. I know God has promised that over here, but we want here. This is where we want to be. 
And Moses, in receiving this from them, is angered with them because it's that type of rebellious heart that caused all of the people to wander in the wilderness for 40 years, if you remember that story. Because they rebelled against God, they didn't trust God, they didn't believe God that he was going to give that to them. God made them wander in the wilderness for 40 years until an entire generation died off. So this is a big threat here. They come to a compromise, they come to an agreement that says that we will stay here, two and a half tribes, we're going to build our houses, we're going to build our cities, fortified cities with walls, we're going to build our pens, we're going to build our corrals, we're going to do everything we need to do to care for our livestock and our families, but our warriors are going to go with you. Now that seems like a pretty good compromise, but I want you to notice something, something here And the Lord really revealed this to me this week in thinking about how simple of a request this was. If you go back to Deuteronomy chapter six, when God is speaking to the people, he says this. He says, when the Lord your God brings you to the land that he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob to give you with great and good cities that you did not build, houses full of good things that you did not fill, cisterns that you did not dig, vineyards and olive trees that you did not plant. And when you eat and are full, then take care less to forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. I want you to notice what the people are doing here. These people are saying, this is good enough. We're going to, on our own effort, on our own will, we're going to build our own cities. We know God has promised us to give us cities that he's constructed that we can just move right into, but we're going to do it on ourselves, by ourselves. We're going to build our own corrals. I know God has promised to give us places to put our livestock in the promised land, but we're going to do this ourselves. We're going to plant our own vineyards. We're going to grow our own food. We're going to leave our children and our wives here defenseless while we go and fight with you. I know God has promised to deliver all these things to us, but we're going to do this ourselves. Now, the question is, how often do we do the exact same thing? When we say, God, here, here's your promises that you have given us. You've given us life. You've given us eternal forgiveness. You've given us hope. You, you've given us through Jesus' promise life abundantly in his name, but I'm going to do it myself. I'm going to be religious and do what looks good, and I'm going to miss the blessings and the favor of God. They decided what they wanted, what they saw now was the work they needed to do was better than waiting on the promises of God. And we do the same thing. If I just do enough of the right things in the right way, in the right way, then God's favor is going to rest on me. If I do it on my terms instead of on his terms, then his favor is going to shine on me. These people come to Moses and they say, we're going to stay here. This is good enough. How often do you and I in our own lives, instead of willfully and humbly with full obedience, submit ourselves to God and say, right now it's good enough. You may have amazing promises for me, but it's going to cost me a lot to obey you. So right now is good enough. That's not what God wants for you. They missed God's promises, the fullness of his favor, the fullness of his blessings, because they chose what they could see immediately instead of trusting and obedience to him. And we do the same. But I want you to notice something else here. The people come to him, or he comes to all the people and he addresses them. We know there's a shift there in verse 16. It says, and they answer Joshua. The, thankfully, the, the commentators and the grammarians point out that the phrasing there of they draws to all of the people. 
So we're no longer holding these two and a half tribes to, to their promise to send their mighty men of valor, their warriors along with them. But we're also coming back to all the people. Notice again what they say. And you can probably see where this is going. Uh, they say in there in verse 17, uh, excuse me, verse 16 says, all that you have commanded, all, all means all, we will do. Wherever you send us, we will go. Just as we obeyed Moses in all things, we will obey you. The problem is, is that they didn't. They didn't obey Moses in all things. They didn't. And then in the future, as we go through here, they're not going to listen to Joshua in all things. In Exodus 24, when Moses was coming down from the mountain of Sinai, after receiving the Ten Commandments and the law from the Lord, he delivered them to the people. And, and the people answered with one voice, we will do everything the Lord has commanded. God, I'm going to do everything you said I'm going to do. You're supposed, I'm supposed to do. I'm not going here. I'm not doing this. I'm doing this. I'm not doing this. I am committed. I am doing this thing. And then a few chapters later, they were sacrificing to a golden calf. Now, we come to the commitment that Joshua says, we, they said, we will do everything we committed to do, just as we committed everything to Moses. We very clearly see they didn't, and they can't, and they won't. Joshua would not be able to rely on their obedience, and we will see them fail again and again and again. It, it, it's, it's like that person who keeps uh, signing up and says, I'm, I'm going to do this diet. I'm not going to eat that. I'm not going to eat this. I'm definitely going to eat this. And then what happens about three weeks later? I'm eating this and not eating that, and I don't even like that thing. They can't keep their commitment. But here's the thing that this draws us out in these verses. We can't keep our commitments either. It's not that we are unwilling or don't desire to. It's that we can't because we're sinners and we need a savior. These people come to Joshua and they say, we are going to do everything that you've committed, that you've said to us to do. We're going to do everything that Moses said we're going to do. We're going to do it all. I'm going to do the right things the right way in the right time. But the reality is we can't. Romans 3, 23 reminds us how incapable we are of keeping all the commands of the Lord when it says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There is a nature within us handed down to us from Adam and Eve who rejected God in the garden, said we're going to do life our way on our terms that we each have inherited. So every single man and woman on every corner of the globe has sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And there's no matter how much we do or don't do, we will never reach that mark. Thanks be to God that he provided a way of changing us, of saving us. Listen now, Ephesians 2 describes the condition of us. It says, you are dead in your trespasses and sin. Meaning that because of that sinful nature against, the, against a holy God, every single man and woman, every single place in the world is dead spiritually before God. There's no life in you. Like, the, like that movie happened out 20 some years ago. I see dead people. We are all spiritually dead around us according to the Bible. Ephesians goes on and says, in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince and the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work and the son's disobedience, among whom we once lived in the passions of our minds, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of the mankind. In other words, being spiritually dead, apart from the grace of the Lord, we live out the passions and desires of our flesh, whatever it seems good to do, that's what we're going to do. And when those who are spiritually dead don't realize is how the prince and the power of the air is influencing us. But Ephesians goes on and says this, but God, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we are dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. 
You see, it's no matter how hard we try, we will not always do the right things at the right time in the right way because we are incapable of doing that. But God, in his grace, causes those who come to Christ in faith to go from being spiritually dead to spiritually alive, eternal forgiveness and eternal life. The people making the commitments to the Lord before Joshua, they were making commitments they were not able to keep, reminding us of our own fallen condition that we will not do what God expects of us and we can't. But thanks be to God, he made a way. Thanks be to God, our sins are many, but his mercy is more. We keep doing what we don't want. We are sinners in need of a Savior. And that's exactly what these people say. Notice that again, the begin in the verse 18, it says, only be strong and courageous. Joshua, we're looking to you to deliver us. Be strong and courageous. At the end of verse 17, the people express this second condition. Only may the Lord your God be with you as he was with Moses. And so in other words, there are two conditions being laid out to Joshua. One, we want to see the evidence in the presence of God in your life. And we need you to deliver us. Joshua points us to a need of a savior. It reminds us that we are incapable of doing all that God has expected of us, that our sin nature completely and totally separates us from him. But we need a savior. We are unable to do what the holy God requires. Romans 8 reminds us, for the mind that is set in the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's laws. Indeed, it cannot. We need a savior. And thanks be to God, he has given us the savior. Thanks be to God, he has given us Jesus, Yeshua, who has come and taken our place on the cross. That he's come and received the weight of the universe of sin upon him. My sin, your sin, he died, was buried, rose again, conquering death, conquering sin, giving us eternal forgiveness and eternal life and all who look to him. Be strong and courageous. We are looking to Christ and to Christ alone. These verses drive us to the cross because you need a savior. I need a savior. I need someone who take the curse of sin and the fear of death from me. Unfortunately, we, we trade our need for a savior for empty religion. We make commitments that we can't keep and we say, I'll try harder again next week. Beloved sisters, brothers, we need grace. We need grace. We don't need to keep trying harder. We need grace. Like the people waiting to cross into God's promised land, maybe you're bargaining with God this morning. God, if you just do this, then I'll do that. If I just try harder, then you'll have your favor on me. Until next time. Our sins are many, but his mercy is more. You, I, need a savior. Maybe this morning, God has led you here today to, to open your hearts and ears to the truth that you, you need a savior, and Jesus is his name. Perhaps the day where you are, God is calling upon you to trust in him with as much as you understand, as much as you can, under, can grasp and say, Lord Jesus, come into my life. Forgive me eternally. Maybe this morning you are a follower of Jesus already, but you know that you keep messing up again and again and again. We come back to here. We need a savior. Not just to save us from our sins, but to save us from ourselves every single day. We need a savior. Maybe you're here this morning and you'd be like these particular people joining together in a church family, united together in God's purpose. My prayer of the day is that every single one of us recognize we need a Savior and that we cry out to Jesus who is our Savior. Will you confess him today? As we sing we're going to sing an invitation song here in a minute, time just to respond to the Lord. And perhaps the day that 
that God has spoken and opened in your heart to come to him in faith as these young men and women did today in baptism. So that I need a savior and Jesus is him. I can't do this on my own. As a matter of fact, the more I try on my own, the more I keep screwing it up. I need a savior. Come to Jesus today. Maybe you're here as a Christian and you keep turning to sin rather than the joy in Jesus Christ. Confess that to him. Say, Lord, I need your strength today to do this. I can't do it on my own. Come to him again and again and again because you not only need a savior to forgive you eternally, you need a savior to live every single day in victory. We need a savior. Jesus is our savior. Let's stand together and we pray here. Father, you 